Assalamu alaikum class. Today I am here with the fourth last lecture of our uh, series of online lectures. And you all know that what we have covered uh, during our uh, video sessions, we have covered Mendelian genetics, we have covered Mendel's law of segregation and as well as the law of independent assortment. Extensions and modifications of Mendel laws, which includes incomplete dominance, co-dominance, multiple alleles, ether alleles and so on was covered in three different lectures. We have recently covered sex determination and the uh, the the sex linked and sex influenced inheritance pattern in uh, in, in in different plants and uh, as well as in uh, my, in um, humans as well. Today I am going to discuss about the extra nuclear inheritance, which is also sometimes referred to as cytoplasmic inheritance or the inheritance because of the DNA which is contained within the chloroplast and mitochondria. So let's get started. Extra chromosomal inheritance. Though the genes of the nuclear chromosomes have a significant and key role in the inheritance of almost all traits from generation to generation, but they altogether cannot be considered as the sole vehicle of inheritance. Certain experimental evidences suggest that occurrence of certain extra nuclear genes or DNA molecules in the cytoplasm of many prokaryotes and eukaryotic cells and uh, bacterial cells, for example, E. coli possesses a single main chromosome in the nucleoid, uh, which you know is the region where the DNA is contained within the cytoplasm, and often an extra DNA element which is called the plasmid in the cytoplasm. The eukaryotic cell possesses a main component of the chromosome in the nucleus and uh, extra DNA molecule and chromosomes in their mitochondria and chloroplast. The extra nuclear inheritance or the cytoplasmic inheritance is the transmission of the gene that occurs outside the nucleus. It is a form of non-Mendelian inheritance in which a trait is transmitted from the parent to the offspring through non-chromosomal cytoplasmic mean. It is commonly referred to as non-Mendelian, non-chromosomal, uniparental, maternal, extra-chromosomal, cytoplasmic and extra-nuclear inheritance. Let's just look briefly at the history that how this extra-chromosomal inheritance was actually um, discovered. Now, as early as 1909, there was a scientist, his name was Carl Karens, and one of, uh, uh, he may also be called as one of the rediscoverers of Mendelian laws. He was he actually recognized that the nucleus did not have a monopoly on heredity. He discovered cytoplasmic inheritance, which is an important extension of Mendel's theories, and it demonstrates that the existence of extra chromosomal factors on phenotype. He was able to show that the cytoplasm also carries heredity determinants. In the years following, many cases of extra chromosomal inheritance were discovered in plants as well as in animals. It became clear that heredity determinants occurring outside of the chromosome have the capacity of self replication and they can also be transmitted sexually as well as asexually. Nevertheless, in some cases, the phenotypic manifestation of the extra chromosomal heredity determinant depends upon the genotype. The extra chromosomal determinants may reside in the plastids or in other cytoplasmic component. While the term genome includes all of the chromosomal heredity determinant, the extra chromosomal heredity factors are subdivided into the plastosome, which are the factors which are present on the plastids, and plasmosomes, which are the factors which are present in the cytoplasm. The extra chromosomal inheritance, which is also known as cytoplasmic inheritance or the non Mendelian inheritance, it was first of all identified or reported by a scientist whose name was Boris Efrusi, and it was actually identified in yeast during 1949. Cytoplasmic DNA or the extra chromosomal DNA is present significantly in some important organelles like chloroplast and mitochondria. It is a big mystery that how actually these organelles created their own genome. One theory which states that it was a symbiotic relationship. It is believed that the mitochondria were once free living bacteria. Over a period of time, it created a symbiotic relationship with the eukaryotic cells and established themselves into the cytoplasms and ultimately evolved as an organelle in living eukaryotic cells. Now let's watch a very nice supplementary video on this theory of endosymbiosis.
Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite topics in all of biology, and that's endosymbiosis. If you didn't know this, there are two major groups of cells. We have prokaryotic cells, and then we have eukaryotic cells. An example of a prokaryotic cell is like a bacteria. They simply have a cell membrane, cell wall. All of their DNA is organized in a nucleoid region, um, and, the, and they're fairly simple and fairly small. In a eukaryotic cell, we're going to have a nucleus. We're going to have organelles like endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, um, mitochondria. But what we find is when we look in the fossil record, life started about 3.6 billion years ago, and we just see prokaryotic cells for the longest of times. In other words, we don't see eukaryotic cells show up until around 2 billion years ago. And it puzzled scientists how this shift was made, because there are clearly two different evolutionary pathways. The pathway of the small prokaryotic cells and then the larger eukaryotic cells. And they eventually settled on an idea called endosymbiosis. And what does that mean? Well, let's break it down. Endo means within, symbiosis means together, and bio just means living. And so basically we have organisms that are living together within one another. So that's weird. What does that mean? Well, basically when I read about this the first time, it, it puzzled me. Um, what we think is way back in the day, we had these aerobic bacterium, ones that were doing cellular respiration. So they were breaking down food in the presence of oxygen. We also had these cyanobacterium that were doing photosynthesis and they were essentially engulfed by another host cell and they became the mitochondria and the chloroplast that we have today. And so that's pretty cool. In other words, these cells became part of a cell and eventually became that cell. That means that the mitochondria that are found in all of your cells are kind of like hijackers that have been inside our cell for billions of years. Now you can see why scientists would have a hard time kind of believing that this is true. And the first scientist to really be a proponent of endosymbiotic evolution in eukaryotic cells was Dr. Lynn Margulis. And in the 1960s, I think in 1967, she wrote an article, a journal article, talking about this, this idea that maybe this is how mitochondria and chloroplasts came to be. She shopped it around and no scientific journals would pick it up. After going to about 14 different journals, one journal on theoretical ideas eventually published it. And it was kind of, you know, not laughed down, but it was kind of uh, put aside for a long period of time. And that's because there wasn't a lot of evidence that showed that this was true. But Dr. Margulis kept working and working and working. And pretty much today, we accept this as scientific fact or as close to fact as it could be. And so I wanted to start, before I get to the evidence of why this is probably true, to talk about how symbiosis works on our planet. And so you're maybe familiar with symbiotic relationships, maybe like the anemone and the clownfish, but it becomes way more intimate than that. And so this is a type of coral, and this coral can do photosynthesis. But coral is an animal, so how does it do photosynthesis? Well, basically, they have an algae called symbiodinium. It's a type of dinoflagellate, and this is eaten by the coral. In other words, the coral is taking in this algae just like it would be taking in food, but it doesn't break it down, it doesn't destroy it. The algae lives within the coral. And you can see in this electron microscopy, you can see these little individual algae cells that are found within the tissues of the coral. And so what is it doing? It's producing food through photosynthesis. And that food is then taken in by the coral and return the coral is giving it a place to live. And so we think something like this happened, you know, billions of years ago and that created these first eukaryotic cells. Well, what evidence do we have that this is true? Well, let's just take a look at two. So basically we have a type of bacteria that looks a lot like a mitochondria. They have a lot of similar properties. And so what evidence do we have that mitochondria came from bacteria? Well, the membranes are going to be very similar in both of these. In a mitochondria, we have this double membrane. We're going to see the same thing in these bacteria. The way they reproduce is very similar. Now, eukaryotic cells, how do they reproduce? Basically, they copy their chromosomes. The chromosomes line up in the middle, and then it divides in half, and we call that mitosis. Now, that's not what happens in bacteria. Bacteria are going to copy all their DNA, and then they just pinch in half and we call that binary fission. What we find is that in, even in your cells, the mitochondria are making copies of themselves through a process of asexual reproduction that looks a lot like um, asexual reproduction in bacteria. And so this is another piece of evidence. But why this really, this idea was set aside for a long period of time is that the 
the technology to answer this question wasn't quite there. And once we got DNA and the ability to look at the actual nucleotide sequences within the DNA, were we able to compare the DNA in these prokaryotic cells and in the mitochondria, and we find that it's very similar. What does that mean? Mitochondria have their own DNA. So they're like a cell within our cell. And so this is coding for proteins that are used by the mitochondria. And this DNA looks a lot like a specific type of bacteria. And so again, all of this evidence is piled up, and so we now believe that this is one of the ways that cells became eukaryotic. We think they also may have infolded, in other words, the membrane may have folded in on the side to create some of the complexity, but we're pretty sure that chloroplasts and mitochondria came through this idea of endosymbiosis. And so I remember reading about that and then thinking up this question, and I think it's a pretty good one, and a lot of my smart students will come up with this. And the idea is, okay, if mitochondria are within our cells, but they weren't technically part of our cells, then how are they copied from generation to generation? In other words, where do I get my mitochondria from? Well, you can thank your mom for that. And so basically what happens is in an egg cell in your mom, we've got a nucleus, and but we also have all these other parts of a cell. And so in that egg cell, you're gonna have a bunch of mitochondria, mitochondria that have been passed from mother to daughter to mother to daughter all through time. And so basically what happens is when that egg is fertilized by a sperm, the sperm doesn't bring mitochondria with it. It just gives genetic information because the mitochondria are already there. And so when that cell splits in half, we've got my mitochondria in each of those individual cells. And so mitochondria used to be cells of their own. They're now obligate symbionts inside us. That means that they can't live on their own, but we have this wonderful relationship where we let them make energy for us and in plants, they have chloroplasts and mitochondria that came from the same origins. And so that's endosymbiosis, and I hope that's helpful. So since we are going to talk about the genes present in mitochondria and chloroplast, let's just briefly go through some main points about mitochondria and chloroplast genomes. Animal mitochondria genome are around 13 to 18 kilo bases in size, while fungal mitochondrial genome and uh, higher plant mitochondrial genomes are around 75 kb and 300 to 500 kb respectively. Each mitochondria has 50 to 20 copies of the mitochondrial chromosomes. Human cells have a range of number of mitochondria in different cells. As I told you before that our brain cells and the cells of the kidney and uh, as well as hepatic cells or the liver cells, they have much larger number of mitochondria as compared to the cells of the other uh, organs. Human mitochondria have almost 37 genes inside them. So uh, next is the chloroplast. Chloroplast genomes are 130 to 150 kilo base in size and they have more genes as compared to mitochondria which has like uh, 37 and it has around 110 genes. Most genes are involved in photosynthesis and uh, um, you can also say that there are uh, 20 to 40 chloroplast in um, per cell in case of corn and uh, each chloroplast has around 20 to 40 chromosome which can make around 15 percent of the dna Chloroplastic inheritance or extra chromosomal inheritance differ from the inheritance of characteristics encoded by the nuclear gene in several important respects a zygote inherits nuclear gene from both the parents, but typically its cytoplasmic organelles and thus all of its cytoplasmic genes come from only one of the gametes, which is usually the egg. A sperm generally contributes only a set of nuclear genes from the male parent. In a few organisms, cytoplasmic genes are like inherited from the male parent or from both parents. However, for most of the organism, all the cytoplasm is inherited actually from the egg. In this case, cytoplasmically inherited traits are present in both males and females and they are passed from the mother to the new offspring, never from the father to the offspring. Reciprocal crosses therefore give uh, different results when cytoplasmic genes are encoded, um, they are actually encoding a trait. Cytoplasmically inherited characteristics frequently exhibit extensive phenotypic variation because no mechanism analogous to mitosis or meiosis ensures that cytoplasmic genes are like, like evenly or equally distributed during the process of cell division. 
Thus, different cells in an, in an individual offspring will contain various proportion of the cytoplasmic gene. For example, just consider mitochondrial genes. Most of the cells contain thousands of mitochondria and even mitochondria contains from 2 to 10 copies of mitochondrial DNA, which is also sometimes referred to as mtDNA. Suppose that half of the mitochondria in a cell, uh, in, uh, in, a, in the cells of a progeny are like um, uh, in a cell which contain a normal wild type copy of the mitochondrial DNA and the other half contain a mutated copy as you can see in this figure on the left side. In, a, in, in during the process of cell division, the mitochondria segregates into, uh, into uh, progeny cells at random. So just by chance, one cell may receive mostly mutated mitochondrial DNA and the other cell may receive mostly the wild type mitochondrial DNA. In this way, different progeny from the same mother and even the cells within an individual offspring may vary in their phenotype. Some of the traits which are encoded by the chloroplast uh, DNA um, and are similarly, therefore, they are going to be variable. The characteristics that are cytoplasmically inherited are exhibited in uh, this uh, uh, table where you can see that the, they are present, uh, for example, in males and females and they are usually inherited from one parent, usually the maternal parent. And the third characteristic is that reciprocal crosses give different results. And the fourth one is that it, that it exhibits extensive phenotypic variation even with a single family. Now let's look at different uh, types or varieties of extranuclear inheritance. Now one major type referred to the above is the uh, is called as the organelle heredity, which is on the left side. You see that in this type of inheritance, DNA contained in the mitochondria, the chloroplast determines certain phenotypic characteristics of the offsprings. We have some examples which are often recognized on the basis of uniparental transmission of these organelles, usually from the female parent through the egg to the progeny. In type, which is called the infectious heredity, result from a symbiotic or parasitic association with the microorganism. In such cases, an inherited phenotype is affected by the presence of the microorganism in the cytoplasm of the host cell. The third variety involves the maternal effect on the phenotype, uh, whereby nuclear genes uh, products are stored in the egg and they are transmitted through the egg to the offspring. These gene products are distributed to the cells of the developing embryo and influence its phenotype. The common element in all of these examples is the transmission of genetic information to the offspring through the cytoplasm rather than through the nucleus, most often from only one of the parents. Organelle heredity involves DNA in chloroplast and mitochondria. Now, before DNA was discovered in mitochondria and chloroplast, the exact mechanism transmission of these traits was about to be discussed and it was like not clear, except that their inheritance appeared to be linked to something in the cytoplasm rather than to the genes in the nucleus. Most often, but not in all cases, the traits appear to be transmitted from the maternal parents through the cytoplasm of the egg, causing the results of the reciprocal crosses to vary. Let's begin our discussion with the classical example of irrigation in four o'clock plants. In 1908, Carl Korn, which was like who was one of the rediscoverer of Mendel's, Mendel's experiment and his work, provided the earliest example of inheritance linked to chloroplast transmission. Korn discovered a variant of the four o'clock plant in which some branches had white leaves, some had green, and some had variegated leaves variegated are the ones which are like white and green at the same time. Now the completely white leaves and the white areas in variegated leaves lack chlorophyll that otherwise provides green color. Chlorophyll is the light absorbing pigment you know which is made within the chloroplast. Corum was curious about how inheritance of this phenotypic trait occurred. Inheritance in all possible combination of uh, crosses is strictly determined by the phenotype of the ovule source. For example, if the seed, which is like representing the progeny, were derived from the ovules of uh, the branches with the green leaves, all the prog progeny plants bore only green leaves, regardless of the phenotype of the source pollen. 
Corrin concluded that inheritance was transmitted through the cytoplasm of the maternal parent because the pollen, which contributed little or no cytoplasm to the zygote, had not appear apparent influence on the progeny phenotype. Since leaf coloration is a function of the chloroplast, genetic information either contained in the organelle or somehow present in the cytoplasm and influencing the chloroplast must be responsible for the inheritance pattern. It now seems certain that the genetic defect that eliminates the green chlorophyll in the white patches on the leaves is a mutation in the DNA which is actually present inside the chloroplast. Corrin's process demonstrated cytoplasmic inheritance of variegation in the 4 o'clock plant. The phenotype of the offspring were determined entirely by the maternal parent, never by the paternal parent, which was the source of pollen, of course. Furthermore, the production of all these phenotypes by the flowers on variegated branches is consistent with the cytoplasmic inheritance. Variegation in these plants is actually caused by this uh, defective gene, as I told you, which is present on the um, on the uh, inside the DNA of the chloroplast, and it results in a failure to produce the green pigment chlorophyll. Cells from the green branches contain normal chloroplast only, and the cells from the white branches contain abnormal chloroplast only, and the cells from the variegated branches contain a mixture of the normal and abnormal chloroplast. In the flowers from the variegated branches, the random segregation of the chloroplast is the um, is the course of like egg formation produces some egg cells with normal DNA of this chloroplast, which develops into green progeny. Other cells with the only abnormal DNA develop into white progenies, and finally, still other eggs with a mixture of the normal and the abnormal are going to develop into variegated progeny. On the right side of this slide, you see that how the stem and the leaf color inherited in the four o'clock plant, and uh, you see that we have uh, crosses between the flowers of the white and the green and the variegated plant in all combination, and the phenotype of the progeny is actually being determined by the phenotype of the branches from which the seeds have originated, not from the branches on which the pollen originated. Stem and leaf color are exhibiting the cytoplasmic pattern of inheritance. Now let's look at some of the diseases in humans that are actually caused by organelle heredity and they involve the DNA in the chloroplast and the mitochondria. So we have mitochondrial diseases, uh, a number of human diseases which are mostly rare exhibit cytoplasmic inheritance they have been identified these discovered the, these disorders actually arise from the mutation in the mitochondrial dna and most of which occur in the genes encoding components of the electron transport chain which generate the, most of the atp which is adenosine triphosphate in arabic cellular respiration one such disease is liver heredity optic neuropathy, which is also called as LHON disease. Patients who have this disorder experience rapid loss of vision in both eyes, resulting from the death of the cells in the optic nerve, the nerve which is actually carrying the information of the eye to the brain. Now, this loss of vision typically occurs in early adulthood, usually um, between the ages of 20 and 24, but it can occur like at any time after adolescence and this is much clinically uh, variable in uh, its severity or, um, you know, because uh, even within the same family. Liver heredity optic neuropathy exhibits cytoplasmic in pattern of inheritance and the trait is passed from the mother to all the children, sons and daughters alike. Now let's discuss genetic maternal effect. A genetic phenomenon that is sometimes confused with cytoplasmic inheritance is genetic maternal effect. It is the effect in which the phenotype of the offspring is determined by the genotype of the mother. In cytoplasmic inheritance, the genes for a characteristic are inherited only from one parent, usually the mother. In genetic maternal effect, the genes are inherited from both parents but the offspring's phenotype is determined not by its own genotype but by the genotype of its mother. Genetic maternal effect frequently arises when the substance present in the cytoplasm of an egg, which is also called the um, oocyte, encoded by the mother's nuclear gene, are pivotal in early development. 
An excellent example is the shell coiling of a snail which is called the Lamnia um, peregra. In most snails, this species, the shell coils to the right side which is termed as the dexter coiling. However, some snail possess a left hand coiling which is called the sinistral coiling. The direction of the coiling is actually determined by a pair of alleles. The alleles for the dextral are here represented by uh, um, lower ca case letter S which has a positive sign as a superscript and it is the dominant uh, allele over the uh, recessive allele or the allele for the sinistral coiling which is being represented by the lower case or small S letter. Now, however, the direction of the coiling is determined not by the snail's own genotype but by the genotype of its mother. The direction of the coiling is affected by the way in which the cytoplasm divides soon after fertilization, which is in turn determined by the substance provided by the mother and passed to the offspring and uh, in the cytoplasm of the egg. Now, if a male homozygote for the dextral allele who has uh, uh, both the wild type copies or the dominant copies, which are um, SS with the uh, with the positive sign as a as a sub, as a subscript that you can see here, is crossed with the female who is homozygous for the sinistral allele, all of the F1 are going to be heterozygote and they are going to have uh, this uh, genotype as you can see here with a S with a superscript. Uh, positive sign and the S which doesn't have that sign and have a sinistral shell because the genotype of the mother is, is SS which is encoded uh, which is actually encoding the sinistral coiling. If these F1 snails are self-fertilized the genotypic ratio in the F2 generation is going to be 1 uh, uh, which uh, 1 is to 2 is to 1 in which 1 are going to be uh, have both the are going to be homozygous for the dominant allele two of them are going to be heterozygotes and one are going to be homozygotes for the um, for the sinister or the recessive allele. Notice that the uh, phenotype of all the F2 snail is dextral coiled regardless of their genotype. The F2 offerings are dextral coiled because the genotype of their mother is heterozygous and she has one wild type and one recessive uh, copy and it encodes a right-handed right -handed coiling shell and determines their phenotype. With the genetic maternal effect, the phenotype of the progeny is not necessarily the same as the phenotype of the mother because the progeny's phenotype is determined by the mother's genotype, not by her phenotype. Neither the male parent nor the offspring's own genotype has any role in the offspring's phenotype. However, a male does influence the phenotype of the F2 generation by like contributing to the genotype of his daughters. He affects the phenotype of their offsprings. Genes that exhibit genetic maternal effect are therefore transmitted through males to the future generation. In contrast, genes that exhibit cytoplasmic inheritance are always transmitted through only one of the sexes, which is usually the female. Now we have another important phenomenon to discuss, which is called as genomic imprinting. Now, with regard to autosomal genes, males and females contribute the same number of genes and paternal and maternal genes have long been assumed to be or have equal effects. However, the expression of some genes is significantly affected by their paternal origin. This phenomenon, the differential expression of the genetic material depending on whether it is inherited from the male or the female parent, it is called genomic imprinting. A uh, gene that exhibits genomic imprinting in both mice and human is IGF2, which encodes a protein called insulin like growth factor 2, which is like abbreviated as IGF2. Offsprings inherit one IGF2 allele from their mother and one from their father. The paternal copy of the IGF2 is actively expressed in the fetus and placenta, but the maternal copy is completely silent, as you can see here in this figure. Both male and female offspring possess IGF2 genes. The uh, key to whether the gene is expressed in the sex of the parent transmitting the gene. Now, in, in the present example, the gene is expressed only when it is transmitted by a male parent.
In other genomically imprinted traits, the trait is expressed only when the gene is transmitted by the female parent in a way that is not like completely understood. And the paternal IGF2 allele, but not the maternal allele, promotes placental and fetal growth. When the paternal copy of IGF2 is deleted in mice, a small placenta and a low birth weight offspring result. This phenomenon of genomic imprinting has been implicated in several human disorders and we have two examples. We have Prader-Willi and Angelman syndrome. Now the children with Prader-Willi syndrome have small hands and feet and they have um, short height, they have poor sexual development and they are also most of the time mentally retarded. Now these children are small at birth and they suckle poorly. But when they are toddler, they develop um, a very large appetite and they frequently become obese. Many persons with the Prader-Willi syndrome are missing a small region on the long arm of chromosome number 15. The deletion of this region is always inherited from the father. Thus, children with Prader-Willi syndrome lack a paternal copy of the gene on the long arm of chromosome number 15. Now, this deletion of the same region of the chromosome 15 can also be inherited from the mother, but this inheritance results in a completely different set of symptoms, producing Angelman syndrome. Children which are affected by the Angelman syndrome exhibit frequent laughter, uncontrolled muscle movement, and they also have a large mouth and unusual seizures. Now, they are missing a maternal copy of the gene on the long arm of chromosome number 15. For normal development to take place, copies of this region of chromosome number 15 from both male and female parents are therefore actually required. So, the main key takeaways from today's lecture are the extra chromosomal inheritance, which is also sometimes referred to as cytoplasmic inheritance, is the inheritance of the trait through DNA that is not connected with the chromosome but rather to the DNA from the organelles in the cell, which are mitochondrial chloroplast in the case of plants. Cytoplasm also carries hereditary determinants, and the third point is that characteristics exhibiting cytoplasmic inheritance are actually encoded by the genes in the cytoplasm, and they are usually inherited from one parent, who is mostly the mom. In genetic maternal effect, the genotype of the mother determines the phenotype of the offspring. While in the case of genomic imprinting, the expression of the gene is influenced by the sex of the parent transmitting the gene to the offspring. Alright, since we have covered extra chromosomal inheritance, here is your assignment that you need to discuss and that you are going to like do in the class as well. So, the statement is that shell coiling of the snail, Lemonia piregra, results from a genetic maternal effect. You all know that. An autosomal allele which is responsible for the right-handed coiling or the dextral coiling is represented by uh, S which has a superscript with a positive sign and it is the, uh, the one which is dominant over the left-handed uh, um, allele which is for the sinistral shell which is represented by just S. Now there is a pet snail which is called Martha and she is sinistral and she reproduces only as a female and the snails are actually hermaphroditic and they have both male and female parts. Anyway, uh, you have to indicate which of the following statements are true and which of them are false and you also have to explain your reasoning in each case. Okay, so good luck.